Now, there's a great deal that I want to say today, and we have very little time. So for more information about the book, and about how we're using the book to support farm animal sanctuaries, I'll refer you to information that I've put in the packages, which are by the door. So as you leave, grab a package, take it with you. Uh, when my fellow panelists and I were assigned the topic of our workshop, the power of the written word and illustration in animal advocacy, I found myself with a dilemma. What power do they have? I think that before we can arrive at an understanding of the power of words and art, we must first come to terms with their powerlessness. So like Robin, I'm going to begin with the story, share a story with you. Um, a few weeks ago, it was Pride Day in my town of Perth, Ontario, Canada. Yay! <laughs> and of course I was there. I'm a transsexual, I was born female, and I do education around sexual and gender diversity. So I got a table at Pride, and I used it for my mother's book. Why not bring animal activism into queer activism? Eh? Yeah. 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 And um, I also uh, used it for a little children's book that I had created um, as a fundraiser for sanctuaries as well. I called it Sanctuary, a children's story for all ages. Um, so there I was at my table, and a woman came up, and she was drawn immediately to my mother's book. She looks at it, reads the title, and just as immediately turns away. And uh, she went instead to my children's book, perhaps thinking it would be safer. She, <laughs> she opened it right up to the page of my drawing of a face on a stick. She was all oh, looking at me. She says, these books aren't going to make me feel bad about eating meat, are they? <laughs> I didn't know what to say. And I told her, I suppose that's up to you. And that's the problem, isn't it? Because the words are out there, the art is out there, and either people look and turn away, or they look, they see, they hear, and yet the armor surrounding their hearts remains intact. So words and art in themselves are powerless. What then makes the difference? And this question is nothing new, Philosopher George Steiner explored what he referred to as the psychology of aesthetic reception. He describes the power of art. He says, the encounter with the aesthetic is the most ingressive, transformative summons available to human experiencing. But, as he so poignantly asks, how does the graft onto our being take? His answer, we don't know. And in fact, this is a core dilemma of suffering eyes. I'm going to share with you a few readings that capture this. Um, there are many threads in this book, and I've drawn out just this one for our purposes today, exploring the tension between the power and the powerlessness of words and art. I'll begin with a reflection aptly titled, What Has the Power? If I painted a building, would I dare to paint the horror? One great big mural with all the suffering on it. Like the walls in the Portuguese restaurant, covered with larger than life images, tracing the whole unspeakable story from happy families of sows with their playful babies to tiny skewered bodies bleeding for your culinary pleasure. The people all around me feasted on those baby pigs and though they glanced up from time to time, they remained strangely blind to the haunting eyes staring down at them. I, newly awakened, ate my bread and salad and grieved for those broken bodies and their desolate mothers. From that moment to this, I have longed to understand what changed me and what could change others. What has the power to stop the horror? So if I painted a building, what could I paint that would make a difference? Great cruel strokes of black and red for all to see? Grasp the whole world and pull it down into the same grief I'm drowning in? Is this what I have become? A messenger of ugliness and sadness? A thief of comfort? A prophet no one wants to hear? When faced with horror, how can anyone paint pastels anymore? In the midst of a holocaust, how can art exist at all? 
other than for rescue's sake. Rescue. How can I translate screams into images large enough for people to see? Perhaps what I need to paint are eyes, suffering eyes, and the change will come when one person looks into one creature's eyes and sees the suffering there. From that point of searching, we must go further. And we find my mother at the point here, in this reflection, wrestling with the futility of words. Um, she wrote this reflection after watching a documentary about orphaned elephants in Kenya. It's called Feeble. I'm stuck in the mud of my muddied mind. It's those baby elephants. I can't go there. Rage is waiting for me if I go there. Helpless, impotent rage. A world of evil and I sit here with nothing I can do about it. Except spew out pointless drivel on a page. For what? My fingers keep punching out the letters, punching out the words, feeble jabs in the air while humans like me are ripping apart great beautiful beings and leaving the babies to die of grief. Human, mean, ugly thing to be. What good are words when babies are longing for their mothers? And From that place of futility, we must go further, turning the page behind my mother's reflection the day I broke. And for that one, she saw fit to include only the news headline, which you will remember. South Korea buries one million pigs alive. The rest of the silence. Turning the page, we find my mother at a place beyond searching, beyond futility, to despising words. And this reflection is called Your Torment. Where has hope for the future gone? Down in the pit with the pigs? Down on the floor with my screams, trying to block out theirs? What good are these words I write? Try offering words to that pig falling into the pit along with a million others. Let words be buried along with them as the dirt piles over their broken limbs, smothering out that last glimpse of the sun, choking off their short, miserable lives. See how much good words will do for them. Here, pigs, breathe these words. Let these words comfort you in your terror and agony. Words, stupid human words. Here. Let them ease your torment. And from that place of despising words, we must go further. To where my mother comes to the end of words. And that's the title of this reflection. I saw your photograph in a magazine. A powerful black bull rhinoceros transfigured into a helpless, unrecognizable mass of suffering. Raw wounds where your horns used to be. Your shoulder shattered, your glory mutilated, your eye fading with sadness. You bear in your dying visage the agonies of all those helpless creatures whose torture and slaughter I have witnessed. Always as I write these words for the sake of rescue, I know there is nothing my words can do to change what happened to any of you. And that makes my words a blasphemy, because they're not for you. So, we have deconstructed our way all the way down to the very blasphemy of words and art in the face of suffering. Imagine standing right in front of a suffering animal and responding to that by, I'm going to go write about this. I'm going to go paint the paint. It seems blasphemous in that context of being face to face with suffering. So when words and art lose their blasphemy, 
it is a sign that we are already disconnected from the suffering. But, just as my mom goes on in her book after coming to the end of words, so must we. And from here we can begin reconstructing. Now we can ask the question, if words and art in themselves are powerless, then what power do they have? I found an answer among the opening quotes of my mother's book. <clears throat> it is a Hasidic tale. A disciple asks the Rebbe, or Rabbi, why does Torah tell us to place these words upon your hearts? Why does it not tell us to place these holy words in our hearts? The Rebbe answers, it is because as we are, our hearts are closed and we cannot place the holy words in our hearts. So we place them on top of our hearts, and there they stay until one day the heart breaks and the words fall in. That is their power. We must have words and art at the ready, planted into or onto every part. In whatever big ways or little ways we're in. The, the woman at Pride Day, you know, who knows how long, the image of the face on the stake will linger in her mind's eye. And when children see my drawing of Piglet in a hot dog bun, the reaction is universal. It's sadness. How can that image not resurrect itself in them the next time they're handed a hot dog? We have no power over the power of words and art. All we can do is have them at the ready, everywhere in every way, and then set ourselves to the task of tending to hearts. Our task is not to break hearts. We have no power over that, but to tend to hearts. Healthy hearts must be our priority, because what does the healthy heart do? In my mother's words, it came. Hearts that are well do what hearts do when faced with the suffering of others. They break. By observers, and even by the one experiencing the grief, this may be perceived as a kind of sickness. But in reality, it is the only healthy response. We must make hearts healthy. Then they will break. So the question we are left with is, what makes a heart healthy? Perhaps, again, we can arrive at an answer by exploring the opposite. What makes a heart unhealthy? I believe with all of my heart that it is disconnectedness. Disconnectedness from animals is what makes us capable of abusing them. And disconnectedness from one another in our human relationships further hardens our hearts and makes us immune to the power of words and art. So it is my conviction that connectedness is our highest priority in animal advocacy. In the packages, uh, which I again will remind you not to forget to grab as you go out, um, I've included a talk that my mother gave last year at VegFest Guelph on connectedness. And she goes deeper into just how radical and radically important connectedness is. So what's the moral of this story? As I see it, the full circle of our responsibility as animal advocates is this, to put the words and art out there while preserving connectedness, which is the only way for hearts to be healthy, which is the only way for hearts to break, without which our words and art are powerless.